So we're delighted to introduce our speaker this evening, Fiona Watson, historian and writer, who joins us to give her talk titled The Rocky Road to the Declaration of Our Broth, or Why Nothing is Ever Quite As It Seems. The Declaration of Our Broth is one of the most iconic relics of medieval Scotland. It is also the most eloquent statement. I don't know if everyone can hear me, but I think Veronica was going to say it's the most eloquent statement of um, self-determination in medieval Scotland. Um, I don't know if I should possibly hash on because I've got a lot to get through in a very short time. Well, there, Veronica, are you back? I know this is me, Jocelyn, Fiona. I don't know what's happening. It looks like Veronica may have cut out, so please do um, go ahead. Very Thank welcome. you very much. Um, Joss, can, can everyone see my slides now? Um, I can see them. If anyone else can't, please say so in the chat. Right, I shall just have it on. Well, as I say, I'm um, very, very glad to be here. Um, thank you all very much for coming. Um, and a big thank you to those of you who actually know me. <laughs> I'm very grateful to you. I'm going to hash through an awful uh, lot, so I shall crack on. Um, and hopefully, there we go. Okay, you'll recognise um, quite a few of these uh, people. Here, of course, is Robert I, King Robert of Scotland, and Edward II of England. Um, less well-known, but very important, Pope John XXII. He's going to feature heavily and is an interesting man, to put it mildly. And then we have Philip V of France, who's we, uh, possibly not just because he's young there, uh, but because he's not that important to our story, thank goodness. Anyway. What we've got to remember, of course, is that this comes, this, 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 what I'm going to describe is the period in the aftermath of the Battle of Bannockburn, which, of course, we all know about and celebrate, great, celebrate greatly. But we should recognise that contrary to many of the books written about the period, didn't achieve what King Robert wanted it to achieve. Uh, namely, it did not force England to the negotiating table to acknowledge Scottish independence and a Bruce kingship. So that's the, the, one of the contexts that we'll deal with. So uh, in terms of a plus and minus sheet for both uh, kings, we've got Edward the, the second here on, on the left. <laughs> yeah, obviously he's militarily in it. And the Scots now have um, the hegemony, someone has described it as, in the British Isles in terms of military activities. England is very deeply divided. Um, the Earl of Lancaster is Ed Edward's cousin and probably has designs on his throne. Uh, uh, so there's him in one faction versus Edward himself and his favourites. And he also, Edward, has money problems. Mind you, who doesn't in this period? Uh, inherited to a large extent from his father. On the plus side, he's very stubborn. He, you know, we all have an opinion of Edward II, but he's just as stubborn as his father. And he has, of course, more resources than the Scots. He also, in this period, very much for a long time has the Pope's ear. He also has Edward Balliol, who's the son of the former Scottish King John Balliol, um, whose throne, to some people, Robert Bruce had usurped. Uh, speaking of which, here's uh, King Robert's plus and minuses. He still and always was uh, a usurper and murderer for many people, and that's not just the English, for many Scots um, as well. Nothing he can do seems to budge Edward II. That's, you know, they're both probably as um, stubborn as each other. And there is no doubt that there is a degree of lawlessness in Scotland because of the wars and the difficulty, because basically Robert Bruce had to reconquer his kingdom uh, over the preceding years. But since um, uh, 1311, he, the Scots have raided the north of England and they have gained and are gaining considerable amount of revenue, which of course goes back into financing the war effort without having to tax um, his own uh, people, which would have made Robert Bruce very unpopular. Very important to this story, he does have the effective control of information circulating in Scotland um, because of the support um, to him of the Scottish Church. And he's not going to budge any more than Edward the second is. So we need to understand in terms of the, the declaration of growth why it's sent. We kind of just accept the fact that it is sent. <laughs> that's, that's an irrelevancy because it's just such a gorgeously um, articulated document. But another question we need to ask is, was it sending a sign of weakness or strength for King Robert Bruce and the Scots? And in actual fact, I would argue that to some extent it is uh, and um, exposing a little bit of the weakness in Bruce's situation in uh, 1319-20. 
On the other hand, there's Edward II, how successfully had he bent the Pope's ear and was that a, a changing, fluctuating thing? So the declaration must be seen as part of a much bigger um, picture that um, shows us how both sides are doing in the aftermath of Bannockburn, uh, given that Bannockburn did not solve anything. Now, there's one other fact that we should remember, which is a date, nothing to do with what's going on in Scotland or England. In the, um, 1311 to 12, there was a big um, sort of pan-European church council meeting in Vienne. Um, and at that council meeting, it, it was decided that uh, Christendom should go on crusade to try to recover the Holy Land, which was now totally out of Christian hands. Um, and that is fundamental to our understanding of this whole period leading up to the Declaration. So Bruce should be riding high after Bankburn, and of course, in many ways he was. Um, he's desperate to try to bring um, Edward II to the negotiating table. But of course, what he wants is a, uh, a piece um, based on his own um, needs, which is Scottish independence and recognition of Bruce's kingship. He immediately, you know, they've, they've, they've only just got sent the English packing and the Scots launch um, more devastating raids into the north of England, which causes real economic hardship. There are negotiations um, in that year, in 1314, but nothing came of it. Uh, because of the use of fundamental contradictions, Edward II will not give up on what he believes as his inherited right um, to Scotland. And of course, uh, that's anathema to Bruce and the Scots. And we should also remember, and this is important in terms of what's happening militarily, Bruce loses the Isle of Man to the English at, um, at um, the turn of 1314 to 15. So oh, obviously 1314 wasn't a great year for Edward II. It was personally humiliating, but it didn't make a, a much difference to how he viewed um, the Scottish situation. And he's always trying to bring another army uh, up to Scotland to try to recover his position, because apart from the um, important um, town of Berwick, the great port of Berwick on the border, uh, the, Scot the English didn't hold anything of Scotland. Uh, the Earl of Lancaster and there's some opposition voices within England are, of course, it's sort of in the ascendancy at this point, and Edward, to, to an extent, has to do what they say. Okay. So, Bruce, you can never accuse him of being short of an idea of, or two, and by 1315, he is considering opening up uh, more military fronts, most particularly in Ireland, but there's a very strong suggestion that they were trying to rouse the Welsh as well. Wales, of course, had been conquered by previous English king Edward I, um, and there had been rebellions uh, since that, that time, since, since the 1280s. We also have to acknowledge the long-term vulnerability of his reign. One that thing that Bannockburn did succeed in doing was uh, recovering the Bruce women. The Queen, Elizabeth de Burra, and her stepdaughter, Marjorie Bruce, who is, of course, the only um, child that King Robert has had in this period. Um, so their return to Scotland in 1315 is very important and is really the only tangible result of um, the battle in terms of making a difference in Scotland. Scots in 1315 besieged Carlisle. Um, but are rebuffed. So that's the first time, you know, that's a bit of a failure there. I mean, and in a way, the English do see the Scots as becoming invincible. And I think the Scots also believe that themselves. And in many ways they are. Um, but I think this period, there's, there's signs of some weakness um, on the military front. Um, so the, um, well, the, the Irish campaigns are very, very important in this, in this period. But we should also remember that 1315 to 17 is a time of deteriorating climate. Uh, there's famine, there's cattle disease, um, there is, um, a, this is a very difficult um, period all over um, uh, Great Britain and Ireland. And of course, the, the war in Ireland is not something that in the end will endear the Scots to the Irish. Interestingly, in this period too, Edward II, just showing you that he has not changed his mind at all, dusts out, out down all the, he wants to get all the paperwork that shows um, uh, the rights of the English crown over Scotland and also showing that Robert Bruce himself has in the past acknowledged that overlordship. So 13th year, which we are on the march, so I hope you're, you're still hanging on to your seats there. Um, so Ireland is the major focus in 1316 and, and King Robert himself 
uh, goes there over um, the summer campaigning season. Um, and that's, a you know, bearing in mind that, OK, um, the Queen has returned, but, you know, you're not, you're not going to have a baby if you're not actually there. So that's a consideration. But you can see how focused the Bruces are, both uh, King Robert and, and Edward. Now, very important, in August 1316, we have the election of Pope John the 22nd. There's been two years where there's been no Pope uh, because of various disputes that we don't need to worry about. Um, now, John the 22nd's name is actually Jacques Duez, who's regarded, he was a lawyer, he was regarded as very wily, and he was certainly intent, as the previous Pope had been, but this guy was more effective, in, in trying to recover the papal position and trying to make sure that any rights, this is what everyone was doing, any rights that should, he believed, should accrue to the papacy are, um, are being kept throughout uh, Western Europe. One of the things he does fairly quickly, and this has an importance uh, bearing on Scotland, is he uh, says that he only he can appoint bishops. Um, um, uh, that's partly a money-making um, scheme because you have to pay um, something to him for this, but um, it's also it, it's also giving him control over appointments. So um, that's going to prove interesting and useful for him. Um, so he really goes to town about uh, getting this crusade. Uh, he is absolutely obsessed with it. Uh, the pro big problem, of course, is that half of Western Europe is fighting with itself uh, rather than um, getting into the saddle and going to the Holy Land. Um, and that's not just Scotland and England. Um, remember, of course, that it, England itself is divided internally um, and the relationship between uh, King Edward and his cousin, uh, the Earl of Lancaster, is also important to this story. So in November, um, this is November 1316, uh, King Edward does engage in peace talks with the Scots, which of course doesn't get anywhere in terms of actually a final peace, but does result in a truce, which is probably useful to King uh, Robert because he, he's, you know, dotting back and forth to Ireland from Scotland. So there is that truce that will last until midsummer 1317. But it is quite likely that now there's a new uh, Pope that King Edward is trying to look good because he knows this Pope uh, wants peace. He is already planning a major embassy to Avignon. The Pope's are in Avignon, not Rome, don't worry about it. Um, uh, so he's going to send a big embassy um, and he's very much, in terms of the Anglo-Scottish situation, going to put his point of view. 1316 is also the year in which Robert Wishart, the Bishop of Glasgow, a staunch patriot, a man who's been involved in Scottish politics right through um, since the death of Alexander III back in the 1280s, that's a personal loss for Bruce because um, uh, Wishart had, had backed, personally backed um, Robert Bruce and indeed suggested to him back in 1306 he should take the throne. But it's also a large headache for uh, Bruce because uh, all the bishops are important. Glasgow is, is very important, Bishop Rick. Um, and how are we going to um, deal with getting um, the next Bishop of Glasgow appointed um, as a man who will be supportive of Robert Bruce? Now, the Glasgow chapter, of course, um, does elect. At this point, they, they don't know that the Pope sort of said he's, he's going to appoint all bishops. So they elect their own man, Stephen Dunadier, but equally Edward II um, also nominates his own man and they'll be both telling the Pope what they've done. Now, January 1317, this big, big um, English uh, embassy goes to Avignon and they're, you know, they're A, telling the Pope their version of um, how Robert Bruce did terrible things and how, Ed, you know, Edward the Sixth first and Edward II have been robbed of their rights uh, in Scotland and they've got all this paperwork to show that um, and also you know they're they are basically bribing cardinals to um, to you know argue on England's behalf and immediately you can see uh, that um, the Pope is is well if he's not he may or may not be impressed but he's certainly willing to listen and he's certainly getting a particular view of Anglo-Scottish relations that suggests that it's Robert Bruce who is the barrier uh, to peace. But what was noticeable, striking about this Pope is that he never closes any door. He is going to, um, he'll be tough, uh, tough talking, 
uh, very much standing on his authority as Pope and very, very, very keen to make sure that everyone acknowledges um, just um, how powerful he is. But he, he will always leave the door open, um, even if he's you know absolutely incandescent, apparently, with rage, as he will be, um, that he will make sure that um, you can still come back. He wants he, he will do anything to get what he wants. And what he wants is this saint. So in April, um, what we also what we see is that um, the British Isles are regarded as um, an area that the, the Pope wants to get personally involved in. He sends these cardinals um, and he sends them with a veritable cornucopia of letters, um, some contradicting each other that would be useful in any circumstance. But one of the things at this point he is prepared to contemplate is the release of Scots from their oaths of allegiance to King Robert, which is a very serious um, thing. But that's not all that he will do. And some of it is um, some of it will be helpful to King Robert and some of it won't. Dunedir, who's the, the, the bishop uh, elect of Glasgow, he goes uh, to Avignon and is told by the Pope. Now, we don't really know what the Pope says to him, but he's he's told that he can't be consecrated as bishop. Um, and he's got to go back to Scotland, but it's quite clear, despite whatever the second says, he's sort of crowing about the fact that Dunedin wasn't made Bishop of Glasgow. Um, but in actual fact, it's quite clear that Dunedin was supposed to go back and be consecrated. So that meant that, that um, King Robert would have his man, uh, but he dies um, on the way back. So obviously uh, Edward appoints his uh, guy, to Eggles uh, John Egglescliff, to Glasgow. Um, Bruce returns from Ireland in June, just as the Cardinals are arriving in London. And they are um, concerned about the Scottish situation and letters are, are sent, but um, immediately what they're worried about is the deteriorating relationship between King Edward and the Earl of Lancaster. And they are actually personally caught up in all of that uh, because they're going north, um, trying to take papal letters to King Robert, which is going to prove the major headache, uh, and they get caught up in a rebellion in the north of England. We have to remember in this period, the north of England is in a dreadful mess. They've been subject to Scottish raids now uh, for, what, uh, six years? Very, very um, hard hitting to the point where most um, places in the north of England are paying um, basically blackmail money to the Scots um, so that the Scots don't actually burn them out or whatever. They've got to that stage. Um, there's very, uh, and, and a lot of the guys who are um, appointed by King Edward are actually just as bad they won't they, they're not looking after people they're charging people to come into castles uh, to shelter from the scots it's all a big mess and, and royal authority edward's authority is minimal um in this period so the cardinals are um caught up in in um uh, this rebellion um in, in in the north of england when when various uh, castles are seized uh from king edward um, and of course, Pope's not very happy about that, but he basically tells them to get on with it. Um, so uh, the only good thing as far as um, Robert Bruce is concerned, and I think this indicates again that the Pope will, you know, give and give with one hand, even when he's taking with the, the, the other. Edward II wants um, the Bishop of St Andrews, the premier Scottish Bishop, William Lamberton, who's been there since 1297, very, very important to Robert Bruce. Um, he argues that he should be replaced because um, because uh, it's really for the King of England to have a say on, on Scottish bishops. Uh, but the, the Pope says to him, to Edward, uh, basically, well, I, I don't know of any um, anything that's been said against Bishop Lambertin um, that should lead to his being stripped of uh, being a bishop. So he's kind of telling Edward to just calm down um, and that in the end it's up to the Pope. Who should be bishops, but I think he's also trying not to shut the door to Robert Bruce. Now, this is the problem. What, how is the Pope going to address Robert Bruce? Because the problem is that for all of Christendom, Robert Bruce is not recognised as King of Scotland. Um, and Edward II, of course, is con con constantly arguing that he should not be called King. But of course, the Scots view. Now there's um, that, that, of course, Robert Bruce is king. So we've got a letter, but we don't know how to address it. And you're going to annoy one person if you if you do one thing, and you're going to seriously annoy the other person if 
you don't. So what the Pope does is he reminds King Edward of a previous Pope's uh, version of events, which is that uh, just because it, if King Robert is called King Robert in the letters from the Pope, it doesn't mean he's actually king. So this is the kind, another kind of fudge um, that uh, is being used. So because basically the problem is that King Robert will not accept any letters and is called uh, king. So this is what happens in September of October 1317. The papal letters, the the cardinals who got caught up in the Middleton Rebellion, they they they, they, they go back to London and have a, a long lie down, um, but. Uh, they send uh, messengers into Scotland um, and they are taken before King Robert, who is very courteous to them, gives them, giving them safe conducts to come to him and he speaks with them. And, and they say, well, you, you've got to understand that we can't call you king because that would prejudice um, any, you know, opinion, legal opinion on whether you should be or not. And King Robert points out to them that not calling him king is taking a position. Um, and it's a position that as far as the Scots are concerned is not tenable. So what's really interesting, and, and basically he sends them on their way and has will not read because he, what he says to them is, well, you know, who is this Robert Bruce? There's loads of Robert Bruce's in Scotland. How do I know which one you mean? You know, so um, so they're set on the way and King Robert doesn't read uh, what the Pope has sent. The reason he doesn't do that is because he doesn't want to take account of what the Pope is saying, because King Robert has certain military objectives that he's going to stick to. And he's very afraid, he probably already knows, that the Pope, uh, he wants peace, the Pope wants peace, he, he'd be pushing for a truce between Scotland and England, and that would be very inconvenient, shall we say, for King Robert. So although the, the business about um, how he's addressed is very important to Robert Bruce, let's not fool ourselves into thinking that this is a principle that he will not, he will go to, you know, the final degree on. He won't. It's it's a means to end, an end in this um, game, if you like, of this diplomatic toing and froing. So the papal truce uh, between Scotland and England, which um, the, the Pope had um, said should take place for two years, it was promulgated in March and then brought to Scotland by the Cardinals. Uh, well, they try again. Basically, the Cardinals send somebody else this is time. He's a, a friar from Berwick. And again, he, he goes north uh, from Berwick and finds Robert Bruce in some woods, uh, not very far away, 17 miles north of Berwick uh, with lots of siege engines because King Robert is very intent on taking Berwick. And so he's very alarmed by all of this, but he's given a safe conduct to go and get um, all his paperwork from Berwick, and he's brought back to um, uh, to where the king is in this wood. But Bruce himself isn't there, and some of his um, uh, courtiers, if you like, some of his key men, they're there, and and they say, "Well, look, who, who is it dressed to? Oh, it's just this Robert Bruce again. We don't know who this guy is. Uh, you're not you know, you're not going to see the king." Uh, the, the, the friar is, is, is canny, this one, um, because he, 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 he's he got to tell them about this papal truce. That's the whole point of the exercise. Uh, so what he does, and this is the first known reference to uh, Scots language, the vulgar Scots, um, vulgar in this case just means the vernacular. Um, so he speaks in Scots and basically pronounces this truce so that they cannot say they don't know, which is exactly what they've been trying to claim. Um, so he does it um, and um, he goes home and he's beaten up and his clothes all taken off. So he was a brave man. <laughs> um, but Bruce continues to plead ignorance for it. So um, the, the, the Pope's still trying everything. He sends the Cardinals one letter that's addressed to King Robert, another letter just plain Robert Bruce and basically tells them to see what the lie of the land is. But at this point in time, there hasn't been any King Robert letters made their way to Scotland. And the Scottish position is that we're not reading anything that isn't addressed that. So uh, it's quite obvious why. 1318 is the year when in April the Scots take Berwick, very important. And that's the last bit of um, the castle falls a few weeks later. That's the last bit of the, the, the pre-1296 um, border when 1296 is when Edward I invaded Scotland and took Scotland over. Uh, basically, that's Robert Bruce having reconquered the entirety of Scotland up to the border um, as it was then. Um, so you could think, well, he could maybe just stop now. He's got back his kingdom. But no, 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 no. Um, he, uh, he, uh, Bruce is very intent on um, carrying on into England um, raiding. Uh, he raids as far south as Yorkshire, He to, to a large extent controls uh, Tyndale. Um, 
So he is intent on still his military objectives. Ireland is still going well. It has well, it's going been going reasonably well. It's now kind of kind of I think a bit of a stalemate um, in part because of the difficult conditions. But what's actually happening, which is interesting, is and this is ironic for the Pope. Before the cardinals leave, they manage to get the um, Earl of Lancaster and King Edward to um, exchange a case of peace. So they've kind of made up <laughs> as much as they ever will. And Edward gets um, more paperwork. Um, and this is really the prelude for Edward cannot get a, a, another expedition to Scotland, another army mustered unless the Earl of Lancaster is on site. So by August um, 1318, he's got that and he is preparing, is hoping, uh, he doesn't manage it this year, he's hoping that he can go back and get back, Berwick back and move into Scotland and start to recover Scotland for um, himself. October 1318 is the crucial date. In October 1318, we have the death of Edward Bruce at Fochart in Ireland. That is going to change the game. Um, at the same time, or in the autumn of, of 1318, um, a papal bull is sent to England uh, and it will be promulgated you know, throughout England uh, about um, Robert Bruce's excommunication. Bruce was excommunicated after the murder that precipitated him um, becoming king. Um, uh, but this is going a step further because this will impose a, um, excommunication effectively on Scotland as a whole. And what's fascinating is that now, only now, does Robert Bruce think perhaps it might be time to talk to the Pope. So in the autumn of, um, of 1318, a Scottish embassy uh, goes to Avignon, and we know uh, because uh, King Edward's man intercepted um, some of the letters the Scots were sending back that they were looking for um, absolution from the sentence of um, excommunication. And I really do wonder, uh, and I am fairly convinced that it wouldn't have happened, if Edward Bruce had not died at Fochart, uh, King Robert would not have sent any embassy to Avignon despite um, the interdict. But with um, Edward Bruce's death, for me, that suggests that the military strategy employed by the Scots has failed. Uh, they have not managed to bring Edward II to negotiating table, no matter how many fronts they open and how many raids on the north of England. So they um, decide that they will go for the diplomatic route. At the same time, England, ironically, is gearing up for um, their military campaign. December of 1318, we have a, a big parliament um, in Scotland that addresses many of the issues, including um, the succession. Uh, obviously very, very important, given that um, Bruce still only has a daughter, although by now he does have a grandson, but he's still a very small child. And we have other indications that all is not particularly well in Scotland, lawlessness, conspiracies against the king, and revenues being salted away. 1319, more of the same. Um, King Edward finds out the Scots are in Avignon and he says to the Pope they should be locked up. Um, and um, back in Scotland, we have a council meeting to discuss all of this and a letter actually sent to King Edward uh, to some extent, um, re um, already preempting what will be written in the declaration. Um, the Pope is getting well fed up. Um, he's very glad that the Scots, to begin with, he's glad that the Scots are talking to him. That's very important to him. But then um, he, he um, it doesn't seem to make much difference. <laughs> um, in July, in the summer of, of 1319, is the final straw and Edward II starts to appoint to Scottish benefices, which he shouldn't be doing either. Uh, but most importantly, the Pope hears um, that the Scottish church has ignored the interdict. Um, so he's beginning to tear his hair out as far as Scotland's concerned. In the summer, Murray, um, King's nephew uh, reads as far as, as Yorkshire and the English cross the border, uh, although that doesn't end well for them as per usual. So more serious discussions of peace happen, uh, but um, they're not giving up on raiding the north of England um, just to put pressure on, on the English. Uh, but it's really the, what the Pope finds out in the summer of 1319 that, that the Scottish church is not uh, obeying him because that's the point. I mean, he, what's the point of being Pope if you can't get anybody to do what you want them to do? So this is when the Pope summons uh, King Robert himself and the Scottish bishops to come to Avignon to answer, you know, to explain why they are just um, doing exactly as they please. Now, interestingly, another two-year truce is agreed between Scotland 
and England at the end of 1319. So um, as the declaration is hoving into view, as we move towards 1320, uh, England and Scotland, technically speaking, are not in permanent peace, but are not fighting each other. So still more of the same. The Pope keeps, you know, he sends out missive after missive, detailing, I mean, it goes on and on and on and on and on, uh, Robert Bruce's crime. Sometimes, occasionally, it does get a mention of, of the, poor, the murder of poor John Common back in 1306, but most of it is about how King Robert has ignored, has willfully ignored um, all that the Pope has said and all that the Pope has demanded and will not make peace and won't talk to anybody. Of course, uh, we now move on to March of 1320, when there is a full council meeting at New Battle, uh, a high-powered council meeting uh, for King Robert at Berwick, um, even as another high-powered English embassy goes uh, to Avignon. So the date where King Robert and the Scottish bishops are supposed to appear is the 1st of May. And again, the Pope is with one hand trying to be conciliatory and on the other hand, issuing dire threats of excommunication. Um, and he's also getting to the point um, where uh, he says that the um, this is the last censure he can possibly impose on the Scots, because you do wonder, he must be running out of it. Um, he says that the sentence of excommunication cannot be forgiven except at the point of death. Uh, and it, only he himself, John the 22nd, can um, um, issue such uh, forgiveness. So, I mean, bearing in mind that these are men of war, you can understand that um, uh, although they could apply to the Pope, um, you know, that's going to take a few weeks, if not months, uh, and um, um, they might get the sentence of excommunication rescinded on the point of death. You know, the chances are they'll be already dead, in which case, well, you're going straight to hell. So, in June 1320, the Pope is still issuing all this stuff about how terrible Bruce is. But on the 29th of July, he takes a completely different tone. And that suggests strongly that at least two of the letters, because of course, it wasn't just the declaration. The declaration is really the, the letter of the barons. There's three letters. There's a letter from King Robert, there's a letter from the Scottish Church, and there's a letter of the barons. The first two from King Robert and um, the Scottish Church seems to have arrived in Avignon because immediately the Pope changes tone. He's just so grateful that the Scots are speaking to him. He uh, writes to Edward II urging, urging peace. And although he's still going on about what King Robert has done, he, he is saying, okay, right, well, now let's work for peace. So um, that's what happens uh, to a large extent throughout the rest of 1320. Most importantly, um, he's, the Pope suspends the sentences of excommunication until April 1321. And most alarming, well, there's two alarming things for the English king. One is the presence of a, um, uh, a Frenchman uh, as um, one of those who went to Avignon with the first two letters. Uh, the other is a, a Scot called Sir Adam Gordon. Um, so, but the Pope is also proposing that, or suggesting, hinting that, that the whole issue of, of who should run Scotland, whether it was King Robert or, or Edward II, maybe should come to a papal court. I don't actually think the Pope would have gone down that route because he would have had to take a side. And what he categorically doesn't do is take a side, except uh, in the interests of what he wants, which is this crusade. So he, as I say, he always tries to, to make sure he's speaking to, to everybody um, and trying to get them to do what he wants. We know that by the end of August, and actually I would propose that the uh, Barnes letter didn't arrive in Avignon until uh, later than the first two. Um, and um, we, we have, uh, we know something about the first two letters because of the Pope's reply, because um, the first two letters don't exist anymore. Um, but we know that um, King Robert was keen to um, get his candidate for John Lindsay, his candidate for the Bishop of Glasgow, um, uh, put in place. And the Pope says to him, well, I, I've, I've consecrated this other guy, John Egglescliffe, whom the King of England has, has put in, and I can't unconsecrate him because you know, it's done. But maybe in the future, we, we, you know, we can come to some other uh, arrangement. So that's quite emollient. Um, uh, he also urges Bruce to work for peace. He's quite stru he's quite stroppy with the, the Scottish Church, as you'd probably expect. But you know, basically, they have to be on the best behaviour and they have to, to all work for peace. And actually, his reply to the Barons letter, which is issued uh, a month later in the end of August, basically tells them just to all work for peace. Well done, and they will they will be full of of, of joy. 
Um, and it was also clear that, that you know there are now six letters being written to Edward II, and, and it's the deteriorating relationship between Edward um, and his cousin that is seen as as much a barrier to peace as the Scots themselves. So basically, um, 1320 sees a, a complete well, it's a complete shift to some extent. Basically, as long as the Scots um, or show themselves to be working in the interests of peace, then the Pope will keep speaking to them. But the interdict is still in place. That's the most important thing. And I will just about finish. So the, um, the declaration of our book, well, the three letters sent in 1320 have an effect. I hope I've, I've shown that in that the Pope is overjoyed by the fact that King Robert is finally speaking to him. He, never, he doesn't resolve yet uh, the issue of how to call what to call King Robert. Well, he, he still calls him things like, you know, uh, the illustrious uh, Robert Bruce, who is governing Scotland um, on behalf of, 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 of the king, that sort of thing. Um, so in 1324, he does um, make a, he does finally address um, Robert Bruce as um, King of Scots. That's good. Uh, it's probably because he's given up on Edward II. We've gone through civil war in 1322, um, uh, but um, he possibly views the Scots as actually a better bet. And certainly the Earl of Murray, um, who is probably um, the most important person for Robert Bruce in terms of government. Robert, uh, you could argue that James Douglas is the most important in terms of military activity. Uh, and, and Murray is working very hard um, for peace. And what's interesting is that uh, Murray actually desperately wants to go in crusade, and so does Robert Bruce, and they both they both offer to go on, on this crusade, this magical crusade that's been on the go for 10 years now. Um, but the, the Pope refuses because he says they really haven't earned it yet. But if they continue to work for peace, then uh, he will reconsider. The um, interdict is still in Scotland. There are sometimes ways around it. If you've got enough wealth, you could get married in England or, or use English clergy in Scotland. I don't know who they are, but the English clergy in Scotland to, um, to have you married. And what's interesting too, is that the Pope seems to sort of, it's almost either that one uh, branch of the papal, um, you know, secretariat or whatever, doesn't know what the other branch is doing because he will grant um even Edward Bruce was given a dispensation for marriage even even though he was kind of viewed as, as being excommunicated um so um or perhaps more likely given this pope it's just that he, he will not close any door he will he will encourage uh, anybody to acknowledge um papal authority um and work for peace even when he's yelling at you with the other um side of his mouth so um, right at the very, very end, um, this is very close to um, Robert Bruce's death. Uh, of course, in 1328, we have the final peace treaty. Um, and uh, almost as soon as the ink is dry on that final peace treaty, the Earl of Murray goes to Avignon and says, OK, now will you relax the... Um, interdict on Scotland. And that's kind of me the end. The, he, he does that. It's quite poignant, really. Um, OK, initially speaking, this is only a few months before Robert Bruce actually does die. Um, he, he, the Pope does relax it, but only for two years and on payment of £2,000 in good silver, which the Scots have because they raided the north of England. Um, so that is it. So Robert Bruce, and then, and then it's fully removed um, and, and Robert Bruce's chaplain is given um, the authority to do the last rites on, on the king uh, just before he dies in July 1329. Uh, but it is, you know, it's it's right to, to the bitter end. So um, that's a whistlewind, a whirlwind tour of the uh, context of the declaration rather than talking about the declaration itself. Um, I think it is fascinating that how well King Robert controls information, the flow of information in Scotland, that he is able to keep out anything the Pope says, including that there should be a, a truce with England. Uh, with uh, Yes, with England. I think at half the time that there is actually a new Pope and that the Scottish Church is so resolutely behind 
and the Scottish King, but there's a price to be paid for that because diplomatically speaking, Scotland remains isolated, cannot function um, fully within um, the, the Western Europe, uh, although by the 13, um, by 1320, certainly the French King is prepared to be more on the side. On the other hand, the, the Pope never gives up on Scotland and in the end, I think, sees the Scottish King as a better bet than the English King for good reason. Um, it's also clear that the, the, the first two letters, followed by the declaration, the irony is the declaration has the least impact, that already with the sending of the first two letters uh, to Avignon, uh, the Pope is prepared to suddenly start, start um, being more lenient to the Scots, even if the interdict stands. So it is uh, very, very important now. But what I think finally I'd like to say is that ironically, I do feel the A, the death of Edward Bruce in Ireland was absolutely crucial because that did mark the failure of Scottish attempts militarily to bring uh, Edward II uh, to the negotiating table. I personally actually don't think Edward II, no matter what he did, would have come. But um, nonetheless, I think we can see uh, a change of tack almost immediately upon the death of Edward Bruce, which meant that for King Robert, it was now more important that he should uh, at least try speaking uh, to the Pope and exert diplomatic rather than military pressure, because military pressure doesn't seem to have worked. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fiona, for that absolutely fascinating talk. I'm sure everyone joined me in saying we've thoroughly agreed, uh, enjoyed that this afternoon. And um, we're now going to stop recording.